Hello, everyone. In this short clip, I'm going to tell you something about insulin that most of you do not know. So let me share the screen with you first, and then we will start, OK? All right. So this is going to be a very short clip about insulins. So let's start. Uh, insulin, as you all know, is a polypeptide hormone consisting of two peptide chains that are connected by disulfide bonds. Everyone knows that, no surprises about that. So let's have a little more detailed uh, look at insulin. So here is the insulin molecule. And as you can see, uh, it has a, a beta chain and an alpha chain, right? Beta chain has got 30 amino acids and alpha chain has 21 amino acids. And these are the three disulfide bonds. But insulin is not synthesized as such. Insulin is synthesized as a pro protein, right? Which is cleaved. So the beta cell in the pancreas will synthesize a big protein and it will package that in a vesicle. In the same vesicle, it will also package the enzyme that is going to cleave insulin into its uh, final form, which is there uh, in the blood, okay? So in insulin is synthesized as a precursor pro-insulin, which is over here. And the enzyme uh, that is there um, cleaves it. Pro-insulin undergoes proteolytic cleavage to form insulin and C-peptide. So here it will be cleaved and the C-peptide will be released. Okay, both are secreted by the beta cells of the pancreas. So what is the importance of C-peptide? The importance of C-peptide is that if you want to find out whether the insulin that is circulating in the blood is endogenous insulin or exogenous insulin. Let us suppose that a person takes an injection of insulin. Now that insulin will be without C-peptides. You normally, when it is secreted by the pancreas, the amount of C-peptide is equal to the amount of insulin. And that is why we measure C-peptides under certain situations. And I'll give you one situation in a minute, all right? Because insulin undergoes significant hepatic and renal extraction, plasma insulin levels may not accurately reflect insulin production. Uh, thus, measurement of C-peptides provides a better index of insulin level. Let us suppose that a person comes to you uh, with uh, in an unconscious state and uh, you want to find out whether it is an insulin secreting tumor or he has taken a high dose of insulin as a result of which he has gone into hypoglycemic uh, coma or he's unconscious because of hypoglycemia. So you measure the C-peptide. If the C-peptide is there, insulin is being produced endogenously. And if you find high levels, that means there could be or there might be an insulin secreting tumor. But if you find no C-peptide, then uh, you can say that the patient might have taken a higher dose of insulin, all right? So a quick look at the mechanism of action of insulin. Uh, we know that uh, there are three types of cells that basically require insulin to take up uh, glucose. And those three types of cells are number one, uh, adipocytes, the fat cells, uh, skeletal muscle cells. And when I say skeletal muscle, I mean resting skeletal muscle, not exercising skeletal muscle. And the third type of cell that requires insulin, although uh, that's the liver, but liver can take up uh, glucose even without insulin. With insulin, the uptake of sugar or glucose and the metabolism of glucose will increase, all right? So these are the three main organs. So what does insulin do? Uh, how does insulin move glucose into the cell? So that's what I'm going to show you in this picture or in this slide. So here is an insulin receptor, which is there on many different types of cells, especially the skeletal uh, muscle cells. Okay, So 
uh, insulin is uh, secreted by the uh, pancreas and it binds to its receptor, which is an insulin receptor. Now, this receptor is known as a tyrosine kinase receptor, right? So as soon as insulin binds to its receptor, a lot of intracellular reactions start. I'll not go into the details of those reactions, uh, but uh, I'll tell you the outcome, the important things about this reaction, all right? So you see a lot of phosphorylation. It is a tyrosine kinase, a kinase, which causes phosphorylation of different molecules. So a lot of molecules get uh, phosphorylated and a result, as a result of that, this whole insulin receptor complex is internalized, okay? It goes inside the cell. Insulin receptor is internalized. Now, that is one thing, and I'll come back to this thing later on. Many other reactions are taking place, right? And I'll just go quickly through them. I'm not going to tell you what those reactions are. But the end result of those reactions, you know, glucose is still outside the cell. It has not yet been taken up by the cell. So what does insulin do? How does it cause glucose to move into the cell? Well, it turns out that inside these cells, there are glucose transporters, but these glucose transporters should be on the cell membrane. They are not on the cell membrane, they are inside the cell, all right? So what insulin does as a result of all these chemical reactions, we call them downstream signaling cascades inside the cell. These glucose transporters are translocated to the cell membrane. And when it goes, when these receptors uh, insert themselves into the cell membrane, glucose moves into the cell, right? But that's not the only thing that insulin does. Insulin does a lot of other things as well in the cell. But let's first see what happens to insulin and the receptor that was internalized. Insulin is degraded and receptor is dephosphorylated. And the receptor will go back, we call it recycling of the receptor. It will recycle back to the cell membrane and it will wait for the next insulin molecule to come and bind to it. Now the other reactions of insulin inside the cell uh, through these downstream signaling pathways, many genes are going to be transcribed like CFOS, CJUM. So gene expression is one of the uh, outcomes of insulin binding to its receptor. Then glycogen synthase is synthesized as a result of binding of insulin. And obviously that it will cause the glucose that has moved into the cell to be stored as glycogen. And of course, then in different, especially in adipocytes, there will be fatty acid synthesis uh, from sugar, translation of many genes and anti-apoptotic action as well, right? So that was a quick, this is a very simplified version. Actually, it is a lot more complicated. So here's a question for you. Let us see uh, whether you can answer this question or not. I will let you read this question, all right? All right, so you get 90 seconds for each question in the USMLE examination. So the thing is, I just mentioned that uh, uh, the insulin receptor is a tyrosine kinase receptor. So that B must be the correct answer. All right, uh, and on the skeletal muscle, see skeletal muscle is 45% of the body weight in the males and 35 to 40% of the body weight in the females. In the males, it could be even more than 50%. So it is a big mass of the body that is taking up glucose. So that is why insulin is so effective in reducing hyperglycemia. All right, insulin production, a quick word, you know, um, in human insulin is produced by recombinant DNA technology using the strains of E. coli or yeast that are generally altered to contain the genes, to contain the gene for human insulin. So 
by this recombinant DNA technology, insulin gene uh, is inserted into the E. coli gene or the yeast gene through different uh, uh, engineering techniques. We call it DNA uh, or recombinant engineering. Uh, so you see these big tanks over there, they are, they are full of E. coli or yeast and tons of insulin is being produced. And the challenge over here is to purify that insulin. Uh, so, you know, we have so many different types of insulin. We say we have got long acting insulin, we have got rapid acting or ultra short acting insulin. We have got a regular insulin, which is just like the endogenous insulin. So what is the difference between these insulins? See, modification of amino acid sequence of human insulin produces insulins with different pharmacokinetic properties. So modification of amino acid sequence, let's have a look at this thing. What do we mean by modification? You know, glargine is long acting. We have got another one, which is Tegludec. It's a newer insulin that is long acting. It's a half-life is about 42 hours. Then we have got ultra short acting like Lispro or Glulysine, s -part, right? So let's see what do we have in the next slide. So here, what I'm showing you is, uh, an, an endogenous insulin molecule, right? Uh, this is the blue one is the beta chain and this golden is the alpha chain. So 21 amino acids in the alpha chain and uh, 30 amino acids uh, in the beta chain. So we have got uh, 51 amino acid uh, in the insulin molecule. So which one is this? Look at this one. See what we have done in this one is that in the endogenous insulin, we had proline and lysine at position 28 and 29. What we have done is we have reversed them. Lysine has gone to position 28 and proline has gone to position 29. So we made something new, you know, this will have different pharmacokinetic properties. See, what is this? Lysine, proline. Does it not sound like Lispro? Of course, this is uh, this is Lispro, you know, which is ultra short acting insulin, right? Let's have a look at another one. Here again is the endogenous insulin. And we have got another one over here. What we have done over here is that in place of this lysine, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have a glutamine, all right? And in place of asparagine, uh, I think, no, this is glutamic acid. I hope you remember I'm forgetting my uh, amino acid. Uh, let's check, let's check uh, we, whether we have any uh, glutamine. Yes, glutamine should be GLN. So this is uh, glutamic acid. So in place of lysine, we have inserted a glutamic acid at position 29 of the beta chain and at position three, in place of an asparagine, we have inserted a lysine, right? So what do we get? We have uh, a glutamine, sorry, glutamic acid and a lysine. So glu lysine. So this is what we get. We get a glue lysine, right? That's why we call it a glue lysine. All right, let's have a look at another one. Uh, again, the endogenous insulin. And over here, what we have done is that in place of proline, we have, a, I mean, we have substituted a proline with an aspartic acid, all right? Aspartic acid. So that's the only thing we have done. So what do we get? we get insulin as part, all right? Let's have a look at another one. This is endogenous insulin. And uh, this one is glargine. Let's see what do we do to this one to get a glargine. So here it is. I've not shown you the complete chain. What we have done that in the alpha chain, we have substituted uh, asparagine with a glycine, okay? And or in the beta chain, we have added two extra arginines. Now notice that arginine is positively charged. We have got three positively charged amino acids, arginine, uh, histidine, 
And uh, what's the third one? Uh, I think it's a lysine. Anyway, please check that out, okay? So um, what we have done over here is that we have added some positive charges to this uh, insulin molecule, the endogenous insulin molecule, and we get glargine. And glargine, you know, is a long acting insulin. We use it as basal insulin. It lasts for about <clears throat> 24 hours. All right, so that's all for today. And I hope you learned something new in this one. Thank you very much.